and welcome to the, I think, the second talk of Expo Chicago. Thanks very much for the invitation, and um, I'm super excited to have such a wonderful panel together today. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce the three people that are sitting beside me. I'm Rachel Turing, the Associate Curator of Contemporary Art at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and I think I don't have to really talk too much about Kayleen and Michelle as they are kind of very prominent figures in the Chicago art scene, so I'll keep this short for them. Michelle Grodner um, is the um, professor of painting and drawing at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and um, she's a writer, an artist, She's also the initiator, um, together with Brad Killen, of The Suburban, and more recently also running um, The Poor Farm, another more rural um, non-profit exhibition space. And she's also, together with um, two other curators, a co-curator of the upcoming Whitney Banyan. I hope we can find the time to maybe also touch on that topic quickly, as I'm sure that's very interesting for a lot of people. Um, Galen Gerber, also a professor for painting and drawing um, at the um, Chicago the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, right? And um, I think you all know who is, and I kind of tried last night to make a list of artists that Galen collaborated with ever since, and that list got so long that I just stopped at some point. Um, to the very right, um, David Knorr, the chief curator of um, MOCA, the Museum of Contemporary Art Cleveland. And I want to start with the very reason I think we're here together in this, um, um, on this panel today, which is um, David's show at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Cleveland with Michelle that is opening in a couple of weeks? Uh, a couple of months. Oh. <laughs> November 1st. Okay, so you have a little more time. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, so I want to start very generally and I want to ask you to like how it come to this project and where you two started with. Well, I think that um, my interest in Michelle is more of uh, not, not so much about her work at first, it was how does she do all of it? Um, and maybe some of it could rub off on me. And the decision to uh, curate an exhibition with her was in some ways to figure out how she has participated in over 200 exhibitions, has written over 300 reviews, has collaborated with artists like Galen or David Robbins or her husband Brad, um, curated many hundreds of exhibitions, if you consider the suburban exhibitions and the poor farm, uh, teaches, has a family, you know, there's a lot that goes into that. So I, I think I've always been interested in the way that her life becomes so productively engaged in meaning making in the act of making her work and all the ways that she seems to find uh, to pull all these parts of her life into her work and um, again it's um, it, it's a key that I haven't quite unlocked yet to tell you the truth because I'm not I'm not totally sure how she does do it all um, and how she continues to do it all but I think it's that um, this sense of productivity that is not critical, but uh, it's a type of productivity that's based in hospitality and openness, um, that's rooted in labor, like real making work. And tying all those tendrils together is really, I think the initiation of the show is to really look back at that and see how it all began. Yeah, but the fact is, David, I'll, I'll kind of launch in in terms of, and push back actually a little bit on what David's saying, and you know, Ravner Schmabner is what I say, because um, uh, I actually, I don't do everything, and, and one thing that I don't do in, in this kind of field of activities is be particularly stringent with uh, how my work 
circulates. Um, the value of the work is in the studio, right? I'm a process-based artist. So, um, you know, things it move through the world. Uh, Galen will invite me to do something, I will do that and, and, and move on and not be particularly, uh, after the fact, kind of navigating these. I have, you know, great galleries that are now doing that, but um, a, a survey show at Cleveland is really helping. I mean, we talked about this before. Like, David is really taking a life of work and organizing it for me. That's something that I have in terms of the art, art, uh, the artwork itself, making checklists, um, you know, bringing all the videos together. Um, so it's, I don't do everything, in other words. And this is where it's an interesting um, uh, kind of collaboration with an institution. This is what institutions do well. This is what curators do. And for you to do that is, is great. And, but it just underscores the fact that I don't do everything. I think also you, you don't maybe look back no. as much. So you keep moving forward. But you know, to wake up and look back since uh, 1993 is an impressive body of work. So it adds up to quite a lot. And I, so I thank you for being here that for me and, no. and, and bringing it together. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. So, you, you mentioned that it's going to be like a survey, but as I understand it, it's also going to be like a, a very complex layering of different collaborative practices that will have their place in that exhibition. So. Um, it's going to be Misha Brogner's survey, and you're going to be in that show as well, um, getting with a, a work, and there will be the suburban that will be represented, that will host other artists as well. So, um, can you talk a little bit about that layering of different platforms that are adding up to, in the end, become an exhibition? Well, let me say a couple things maybe about the structure of the show, because I think if Michelle had her way, she would um, probably uh, install a museum show, maybe like Maurizio Catalan did his show at the Guggenheim. So um, I think the, the joy for me is looking at all the work from 93 to now and objectifying it a little bit, but also finding the places where these compressions happen. And the places where these compressions or overlaps happen, the kind of hospitality that she has with collaborations with other artists, like Galen, are interesting moments to the show where you start to see things collapse. So if we're looking at the early works that are early representational paintings, and you see them bleed into um, later works that are really process-based, and you see those bleed against the backdrop of a Galen Gerber installation, things start to make um, different kinds of sense. So the collaborations that we're initiating uh, Galen's being one of them, I think, are, are great moments to sort of pull apart the show, um, but also pull out this concept of platforming and, and hosting, which I think both Galen and Michelle do in very interesting ways, which I've done for, for a very long time. Well, let's let's talk about a little bit about platforming then, because I think that that is really one aspect that kind of maybe not unites the two of you, but is for both of you a very important aspect of your work, although you're kind of dealing with it in very different ways. So very generally I am asked, like, what are, what are the very reasons for you to collaborate or to, even more general, like to just reach out to somebody else to incorporate his or her work or their work, um, as you did with this institute, like, um, is it like curiosity? Is it maybe sympathy? Is it maybe not knowing? Is it maybe like just a potential challenge? Yeah, you can answer. And I'm not answering for Galen. Uh, I'm answering for myself, which again, you know, sometimes what we're doing, I mean, the idea of platforming in a general sense may look like what we're very different, I mean, in terms of how and why um, we're doing these things and, and, and making spaces for other work or folding in other work. Um, you know, I, it, I think in the context of the show, what David was saying about, um, you know, where the collaboration or the rebuild of the suburban, the similar for the suburban and hosting other artists, where that collapses is really, uh, where that compresses is really about a collapsing of, again, the Grabner narrative. Not at all interested in, you know, totality, even though that's going to be an excellent result of it, um, I'm, it's not something that interests me as a whole, that kind of narrative construction as an individual artist. Um, so where 
these collaborations or platforms happen, those things start to dissolve. You know, no longer something else comes to the fore. And there's a critical underpinning to that, right? I mean, this is, again, being schooled in the 80s. I mean, it cannot help. It's not institutional critique, per se, but it really is looking at authority or authorship in a kind of way where those things break down. And I think, you know, we have, those are things I think also in Gillen's work, but they manifest in very different ways. Um, so, you know, I, I can launch into, you know, reasons um, behind the suburban and the poor firm, and you know, maybe we'll get to that. But I, in terms of the show, I think that these moments, whether again it's the suburban or the collaboration with Galen, um, or collaborations with my husband Brad Killam in the atrium area, um, these are just things that can kind of peel away, and we can actually start seeing some bigger discourse, right? Again, it's not, it's not a monographic discourse or something else um, that we're dealing with within uh, you know, contemporary culture. Hopefully, those are the things that can come through in those moments that can kind of punch through these places. So trying to pull you in again, um, can you remember like the first time you worked with Michelle? No, David asked me the other day and I couldn't even remember how I met her. So it was one of those, well, it's been a while. <laughs> um, I'd like to say something though about this kind of, we keep using this word platforming and it's not my word. I don't really use it. I kind of understand what you mean by it but I think I would say it differently. Um, How would you, like, because with you it's getting very tricky to find a reword because you would reject, certainly, like, curating, you would also reject platforming, maybe collaborating. I think what I'm doing is I'm functioning as an artist. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think, you know, we also the description kind of included the generosity of our practices, and I really don't think of those terms. If I had to kind of frame it, I would say, I think I'm interested in representation and the kind of ambiguities that that entails. And it doesn't have anything to do with being generous or not being generous. It was useful for me to include other people's work. That, that's, I think, closer to the real answer. Would you, you, would you say that liking someone's work or just wanted to get to know more about someone's work. Would that be two crucial reasons for you to reach out to someone to work with you? For a good reason. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, not liking somebody's work is a good enough reason too. So, how did it go for that small question, for example? How did well, that was, that was a discussion, and actually, Michelle and I proposed something that Galen was not okay with. Um, and Michelle, and Michelle and I both knew that it was a risk. We both sort of understood that we were going to propose a place for Galen to consider working, and we had a strong reason for doing it. Galen does two types of backdrops. He does, uh, I would say, canvas, you can call it, but sometimes they're linen. Um, but they're, based, they're structure forms, and the other are folded paper backdrops. And so we were considering a canvas backdrop, in a certain location that was very questionable. And Galen was very clear about why it wouldn't work. Right now. Um, we had two other options, and luckily those worked. And, and I think, I think that there is something interesting that I, I think about the static kind of objectness that happens when you work with Galen, that what he's trying to get after is, when he's saying representation, this combination of works that get distilled onto this backdrop. That's how I think about this representational idea in this work. It's, uh, it seems like it's always a negotiation that is very cognitive for you, Galen, for lack of a better word. I mean, there's a lot of pre-thought. It doesn't seem as much about uh, expression, so to say. I wouldn't agree with that. Um, well, I'm going to say it slightly differently that, um, you know, for the show that David is doing at Mocha Cleveland, it's really Michelle's show. And the thing that is interesting, being invited in from the outside, is to kind of to witness somebody putting the ship in the bottom. Uh, it's, you know, it's something I deal with on a regular basis. The only reason I said no to their initial kind of proposal was because it misrepresented my work. It kind of it made the ship easily fit into the bottle in a way that wasn't interesting. It did, yeah. And they came back with another proposal that was more in keeping with the kind of feeling of my work, and I think it's fine. Oh, I think but it's what's good. interesting is that 
um, I think with both our work, there's a sense of expression being tied to to what we normally think of as the ground rather than what we normally think of as the expression and the idea that the two things, the, the more figurative element, the more expressive element, and the ground, the supporting element, affect each other. And at some point, they, they can switch roles so that the thing that is supporting can actually be the expression. And what I like about what you're doing and trying to do is that you're mixing and matching in a way in which the roles of these elements flip-flop. So as you walk through the exhibition, Michelle both becomes visible and invisible. Um, and if, you know, it's not yet an exhibition, but if you do it well, she'll be visible or inferred in a larger sense than simply the physical elements of the show. Yeah, that was quite a bit you too. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, then I'm gonna ask you, do you remember the first time you and Jamie worked together? I do. I think it was even before the Suburban, right? No, I think. Painting in the 90s. Oh, well, we were in in an exhibition at the Walk Art Museum called Painting in the 90s in 1995. And um, I've been a fan of Gilmore's work long before he even knew who I was, being a student, being a bit younger, and following him about, um, you know, and kind of trailing around the opening, and he had no idea who I was. Um, But that was the first time we kind of shared an exhibition. Um, And then, you know, you know, I've been. Right, that's right. Yeah, great. So it was the Milwaukee. We, I was living in Milwaukee at the time, and um, so there was a project up there. But when Galen approached me to do the Galen Gerber with canvases, I want to say that was 97 or 98. The flock. It's 99. Was it 99? All right, 99. But then, right, and then it kind of immediately after Galen uh, participated in the exhibition of the Suburban, the backdrop to right. David Robinson, Sam Durant, uh, Sam Durant text. Right? So, so yeah, in the late 90s, things started to. Less in a way where I was no longer just a fan of Galen, but I was actually working with him. <laughs> what would you say? What were the like? What were the main interests that you both shared at this moment in the career? Well, but that's what's interesting now. I mean, sitting next to Galen. I mean, I, you know, I, you know how he's come to you know, understand his work, who he has worked with in this long period of time. You know, it's it's. it's uh, I have I simplify it right. I give it a kind of narrative that isn't his truth, right? It's my truth, and I often will locate it in a more kind of critical location than I think it is. And then when I've heard you talk about it, Galen's, you know, you kind of undercut that often and, and deny that. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I, 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 but truly, as Galen was saying, he is an artist. Um, you know, he, he approaches how he thinks like about using to. It's a very good thing, and. Uh, but at the same time, I buoy the other side of that with the fact that there's kind of critical, um, a particular critique of authorship in all of that, which I think is not as, uh, that's not the, it's not his primary concept, but it's something that I need that work to do and need to keep it close, right? So, uh, you know, as I'm moving through and working with other artists, again, I do it very, very differently because David said, you know, I don't, I have no kind of backward reflection. It really is moving forward. Um, and I think it's, and Galen slows me down, basically, in terms of, not literally, not literally, but in terms of the work, in terms of how I think about those things. I mean, your last show at Wall Space, which rehappened in January because of the flood, I mean, those artifacts that you're making monochrome, you know, that's a very kind of slow process for me to look at them, to understand them, to understand their display, these choices that you're making in, in, in exhibition and so forth. Um, it's a very different rate of speed than when I think about, uh, you know, when I work with other people, when I'm working with other spaces. It's just very different. Um, uh, and that's helpful. I mean, that's just helpful for me to map and then to kind of you know, be able to articulate and see, um, you know, why I'm moving so fast. What are the, you know, the different value systems in place? And so forth. Well, let's talk a little bit about the like institutional side of both of your words. I think you both share a very strong sense for the power of institutions, like how they work and what they represent, and like that whole system. And you're kind of going against it and within at the same time. And maybe David, you can start um, with them explaining how that was, like working with two of them. Artists that are not just artists that you take works and put it in the gallery. You know, I've known Michelle since 2003, maybe, or four, so I've had a long discussion with her, but Galen, 
also, it, I think there's a specificity to the conversation that, you know, asking Galen to do something that I knew 75% chance he was going to say no to was like, uh, no, it's not a fun experience, but, you know, it was also kind of interesting part of the process that I wanted to go through with him um, that got us to a location that helped me clarify some of our decisions. And I think when you ask Galen to come do something, you invite Galen to come do something. Uh, and that is, uh, there's a mysteriousness to the outcome, and there's the tension of not knowing exactly what the needs are, and I think that I cannot, and it's it's correct to not anticipate what those things are. To me, as a curator, that's the kind of institutional rubbing that uh, I'm interested in. With Michelle, um, it's a negotiation as well. I, I think there's the trust and faith of, in Michelle, that Michelle is giving me to sort of pull back or rein the work back, but there's also moments where we're letting this happen, right? And we're letting these dialogues and these potential accidents and messes and new occurrences and new forms of productivity occur. And so I think the trick with the show is how not to kill that, right? And But also give um, some historical perspective on the work. And I think that's like a delicate balance that we're trying to negotiate, and it's it's been a it's been a conversation, but I think we have a good, pretty good understanding. But still, there are there are these moments, there are these things that we're uh, still anticipating uh, adjustments happening, which is exciting. Maybe you could say more about that. I mean, you know, it's a true statement. I started by saying that if Michelle had her way, it would be closer to Catalan's, like everything. Well, let you one way. Well, and I also think, you know, simultaneous to that or contemporaneous with that, with Sherry Levine's survey and Whitney, they were really, I know, both beautifully done, but almost opposite sides of the coin. And I'm curious how you're navigating this, that, you know, you can't put everything in, although you're putting a substantial amount in, and you have to make decisions, and partly no artist wants to be painted into a corner. Right, well luckily that just can't happen with Michelle. Um, it's just really hard to do. Um, and part of that is, you know, you were talking about speed, which I think it's interesting to think about speed with your work because um, the speed, uh, you work in the studio um, doggedly, and it's, uh, maybe you work fast, but you also are, you know, you make a lot, and it takes a long time to make some of the things that you're making. And there's a lot of labor that goes into that. That Those kinds of decisions, and I guess I'm interested in talking about method as related to this conversation, because I think there's a kind of method, and I'd almost like to name it with both Galen and with Michelle, the kind of selection, for lack of a better word, that Galen might be, that exercise, and the type of work that Michelle is doing in the studio, and then to think about the type of work that she's doing outside of the studio that is, might have a speed to it, might have like, here's a thought, you know, and it, and it happens. Uh, I'm just, I'm interested in talking about method and talking about selection, and I think that that, in some ways, is how I'm coming to terms with, with Michelle's work. Yeah, and I'm just gonna jump in because you, you brought up this very glorious moment in New York when Catalan's show at the Guggenheim was up. Everything was in the air. I was prepared not to like it. I thought it would be strong like dead corpses. It was, it was kind of, it was and it, it wasn't. Um, but it was an organizational structure that was quite brilliant in terms of ideas around orbiting and uh, almost a leveling, right, even though it was in the air. And then the, you walk over to the Whitney and you have the Sherry Levine show, which I think we may be one of the few people who really like that show. I think it was extraordinary. Um, and, you know, I, I, I in my own work, uh, I'm trying to actually, one of these, I think, again, I'm, it's unusual to aspire to Sharon Levine. I mean, in terms of some of those ideas, some of the idea of, of repetition in her work, um, we do it very differently, but a lot of those value systems we share, I just don't share the display element of it. I would prefer to think through, you know, this kind of more flattening, uh, in the case of Maurizio Catalan, or, or play with that. Like, that's where the political um, uh, elements are in terms of how one puts forward uh, you know, work and how one thinks about it. So I think, you know, that was, for me, I still, glorious first time in New York when I was able to have all those two shows. But then for you to have to... Well, it's, for me, it's... I don't want to represent Michelle's mind in a productive state. 
right, in the show, as, a, as the organizing principle for the show. I want to get after uh, how it functions and how it's functioned over time and, and uh, create moments where it's happening again. Uh, but, yeah, and maybe Catalan shows Catalan's brain, you know, kind of represent it writ large as an exhibition concept. But it also, to think about exhibitions and to think about the staging of an exhibition is also just clearly part of both the way that you think about what you're doing. And working outside of institutions has been a big part of that. And for you, David, it must have been kind of a special exhibition project as I think you could have been less sure what like the exhibition at the end is going to be then you would have done it with um, many other artists and I think uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about that moment of giving it away which seems to be crucial to all of you in some ways because there is this moment Michelle especially when you're kind of doing the suburban and just inviting people and give them like all the freedom but also you gave them while kind of giving your works to artists and inviting them without any other obligations to do whatever they want. How does that? If I thought they would listen to me, I would give them other obligations. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me a bit, little bit about that moment when you kind of invite an artist to do something. Um, like, are there any, do you have any, like, how, do, how does such a conversation evolve? Can you say? Oh, definitely. I think it's always different. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on the artist. Sometimes I know people beforehand, sometimes I kind of contact them out of the blue. It depends on the situation. It's never kind of in the absence of really having thought about their work. And you know, I always think the opening is that we can actually talk about their work in ways that I think often they feel gratified that somebody's really looking at it. And so, but sometimes things come out of that, sometimes they don't, but um, it usually starts with something that is much more collegial. Even if it's an argument or just, you know, kind of casual conversation. I, I remember I read an interview um, with you, Michelle, and you said, or I think it was a text in art form where you talked about the suburban and you said that there are like three different ways how artists would like react to your invitation. One is like, they would just, put out like, part of their work and put it in the suburban. The second one would be they are, what is the second one? Like the third is they would just come up with something totally unexpected. And I think the second one was something in between. Yeah, where they use a space as a studio. Like they, they're use, not like they just continue their production the in that space. Yeah. Like yeah. Is, would, would that be something that would also apply to like an invitation that you're giving out? Like, these three scenarios that are possible. <laughs> well, they would just do something like it's over, like they like, would just overpaint the work. Like they would just come up with something totally unexpected that you couldn't have even thought of. That keeps on going. <laughs> I don't know the answer. No. <laughs> well, you're asking me, like, it always seems different. And I would say, like, if there's an art to my practice, and I would expect there's an art to your exhibition of Michelle's kind of survey, that you can't foreshadow how things are going to go. That in hindsight, it all looks clear. Um, going forward, it doesn't look clear. And often, like one artist's practice changes the course of my entire practice. One artist's expression changes the course in a way that I tend to accommodate and assimilate. I think you do too but that it's really much more of a kind of Frankenstein moment than anything else. Can, can we start the PowerPoint now, maybe? Give us a couple images. Thank you. <laughs> just, just to have something to look at, right? I see we have like 20 more minutes, and um, let's, let's talk about something different, which is, um, but also maybe I hope that at some point maybe David, you can loop in in that conversation from a very different angle, but I would like to talk about Chicago um, as an art scene in the 90s, and I would also would be very interested in you, David, your opinion in how that 
you can kind of relate that in any ways to something you're experiencing like in I'm a, I'm a generation I'm a generation younger. That's that's so, why I'm like asking you like for now, not for Chicago in the nineties, but maybe for Cleveland in the well, I, I in mean, the in, in the present. But then um, let's let's start with um, Chicago in the nineties. We both were like seven figures at that point here. I don't think I was, uh, because I was living in Milwaukee um, for much of it. <laughs> but um, you, you, you came here like in, in, in 97, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, again, that you know, little bit of narrative anecdotal background, I mean, it was, it was the, the utter freedoms of Milwaukee. Um, there's, there's no fun hierarchy there. One can do whatever they want or do nothing. Um, that's, uh, you know, I started writing for Freeze. We started curating exhibitions. These things that I never really saw on my radar when I was in grad school. But being in a place that didn't have that discourse, one needed to make that discourse. Um, with regular visits with my young kids and husband um, to Chicago to, to look at work. Um, so when I when we moved down here in '97, you know, we just we just kind of continued that kind of work. It didn't even occur to us that you know this is not this place you know has those structures, or we knew they had those structures, but we just continued to invest the suburban opening up right away. Um, but uh, yeah, you know. In the 90s, I mean, for the most part, it was, the, it was a lot of the uncomfortable spaces. It was kind of the dying out of, and I don't want to give a history here of Chicago uh, 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 visual art practice um, and exhibitions, but it was the dying out of the not-for-profit spaces, and it was the rise of the uncomfortable spaces. And then from those uncomfortable spaces, um, you know, there was uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the suburban gallery, I mean, these apartment kind of galleries took place, um, and the commercial structure kind of started to take hold, too. Um, yeah, I don't know, Rachel. What do you, um, I don't. I would, I'd like to, because I know yeah. for, for Galen, for you, Galen, I mean, working in Chicago as an artist for you was a, I think, was quite a conscious um, decision to make, right? Yes. So, what were, just, I want to I wanna hear a little bit about how that, like, because I'm interested in that now as well, I think, as a curator, like, who came from like Switzerland to Cleveland and finds himself in a, in a very different place that I'm used to and kind of not really maybe in the middle of the discourse really but somewhere at the margins and I kind of want to just want to talk a little bit about these aspects about not being like maybe at the very center of a scene or a market or both you know I tend not to think of these things as a kind of cultural proposition so much as a personal proposition. Um, and I think I'm the only artist that moved to Chicago to be an artist. And, and I moved from Manhattan. Um, and it was just that it was a different time in my life and I knew that if I stayed there, um, there was enough going on that I was going to end up being a fan rather than a producer. And I wanted to be someplace where I could have the time and space to do what I needed to do. And I knew it was going to take a long time. And originally, I thought maybe I'd move to California. But at the time, I was living alone and had been only going out at night. And I got on a plane and went to California. And everybody was wearing shorts and jogging. And it freaked me out. <laughs> and I came to Chicago. And it seemed like a city that I could live in. And at the time, Chicago was incredibly cheap. It felt dirty and rough enough that it didn't have a pretense to it. My decision wasn't based on anything more than that. And what's interesting in hindsight is that, you know, I moved to New York as a very young person, like 1920, and I ended up working with a lot of the first generation conceptual artists. And um, at a certain point when I came to Chicago, I did not know about Chicago art about its kind of history of religious work and involvement with surrealism. But it's come to play a big part of my practice. And I think of their, my practice as a synthesis between a lot of different art worlds. Um, and that really turned out to be something that was generated personally, but turned out to be artistically and culturally kind of important. And if you think about my practice now, the relationship between a kind of supporting structure or support and an expression is really the relationship between 70s New York and Chicago. That's kind of an oversimplification, but does that make the work sound better? <laughs> oh, Cleveland is great, I'm really very, very lucky to be there. Well, 
even more so now with having an exhibition venue in place soon. Um, the last minute, which I, we have to talk quickly about um, the witness venue, I think. Everybody's expecting that to happen too. I, I also know that we don't really talk about artists because that's not yet like officially released. But um, I have a have a quote here from Donna De Salva who says, um, "We chose to make the last biennial in the Breuer Building an experiment with a new curatorial structure." Um, how much of an experiment is it really? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know. It Truthful by the fact that it brings into play curation. So when you visit, hopefully you all visit the, the biennial, the 2014 biennial, what you will see is three curatorial takes in the biennial. It's not unusual. There has been you know, many group curators in the past. Also like the Carnegie will be kind of the same thing That's right. happening in the That's right. But it's going to be, you know, you're going to be very aware that when you come to the fourth floor that this is Michelle's take. But I, I'm very, you know, I'm talking with the PR people now in terms of how we're framing it. And again, something that I said early on in this conversation, I'm really resistant of, you know, fourth floor equals Michelle Grabner. But fourth floor equals not a professional curator, an artist, somebody who is not based in New York, but somebody who comes from the Midwest, somebody who is a teacher and, and has worked with students for a long period of time. And what is what are those values? What you know? What is that selection process about? You go down to the third floor and you'll see. Um, uh, Stuart Homer's work, and Stuart, you know, comes from the Tate now at the modern, a professional institutional curator, and, and there will be something else that he will deliver. And Anthony, uh, you know, even though he is uh, at the ICA in Philly for a long time, he worked, uh, you know, most of his work, his, a lot of past work, um, it's all independent curating, right? So it's a different kind of curatorial structure, relationship to things and ideas. So all of that becomes content, and that's really great. So not only do we have, you know, artists, our work, but we have, which is really important right now. If we start thinking about, uh, you know, look at Corbin and Dempsey's booth, it's, this is a, a, a commercial enterprise who's really thinking inventively about curation and kind of uh, and overlaying that in, you know, the art fair. And, you know, there's a curatorial project uh, uh, that's here, and I'm sorry, what's it called? The thing that she means curating, uh, that overarching thing. I mean, so, so you know, curating is everywhere. It's an industry, right? I mean, if you get, you get in flux, uh, e-flux, you know, there's a curatorial studies program popping up in two hours in Berlin. Uh, so, so curating is really important, and to be able to see that and to suss that out, I think, is, is really interesting. So, yes, all of that, Donna, is, is correct by the fact that, um, uh, that, that again, that they're making transparent curation as opposed to it, you know, in the past we've seen celebrity curators, I mean, you can map the Whitney Biennial in terms of trends in the airport, world, right? We were doing the celebrity curating, we had a couple of years of that. Um, you know, the very beginning, when it be went from annual to biennial um, in the very, very early 70s, um, you know, it was just done by the curatorial staff. You know, we don't even know who had their hand in the selection there. So you see this kind of beautiful arc by just taking this, uh, the, the biennial as a sample and seeing what's going on in curation. And so last, I uh, can't officially say it, but it's going to be the last biennial in the Breuer building, at least for eight years, um, probably more. Um, they are bringing curating into the process. Will, will there be any parts in that biennial where the three approaches yeah. overlap? Right. Or, like, were you at all collaborating? Uh, no, that's what, that's interesting. Um, as the process went on, because the par process is virtuous, mind you, um, that we have, have had less conversations. I think at the very get-go, uh, there was conversations. As a matter of fact, um, Elizabeth Sussman and Jay Saunders, who are responsible for the 2012 biennial, um, were the ones to um, put forward this conceit uh, and select the three of us. Um, uh, one of our first meetings, uh, they were prepared for us to say uh, no to that structure, that layer cake structure. And I fought for it, uh, again, for the reasons why I was just arguing, that I think that was very interesting, that we wanted to keep that in play. Uh, but it was something that the other curators were rethinking. Um, there are interstitial spaces at the museum, uh, uh, sites outside of the museum, in which uh, you know, we're all selecting, we're all working with um, various kinds of artists. So we're not relegated to a kind of real estate. Um, and you know, PR is having a hard time with that, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be hard for people, we want to make it easy for people to get their head around this, uh, this structure. Um, so it, it's kind of the connective tissue, but I would have to say that it wasn't a conceptual um, 
back and forth wrestling out. Um, it's, it really is more about artists who are working in these kind of other spaces, and it won't be a, a selection um, of these individual uh, types. No. So without talking about any artist names, I mean, for your, also for your suburban, for, like, there's always been like a, a mix between very young, maybe not even, like maybe even amateur artists and well-known names. And I think for you, Gavin, actually this is something which is true too, like your collaborations or whatever, invitation have always been like with a very broad um, like type of artists from young to established from whatever. Is that something that comes totally natural or is there some kind of strategy? Like do you at all like keep that in mind when choosing artists or is it something that just comes? I'll answer from, from me and maybe two parts. For the biennial, um, you know, I, I would say that the selection of my selection of artists, I mean, I'm, well, it, it didn't set out upon getting this invitation to Talent Hunt. I, that was not interesting to me. I don't do that, don't want to do that. Uh, when we invite young artists to do projects at the Suburban or the Poor Farm, or I think younger emerging artists in other curatorial uh, projects, um, you know, it's for very different reasons. It's usually an idea. Uh, the Suburban, you know, it's trying it out. And, and what's interesting, the radio, I guess what I want to say is that with something like the Suburban, I'm working at this point over, well over 230 artists, you know, for 15 years, things change in the air world, right? Kind of emphasis. When is it time to start looking at younger artists? When is it time to kind of Ooh, kind of lock down and kind of relook at somebody who's been getting a lot of critical play and bring them into a different context. So it really is just kind of reading the landscape to some degree when it comes to the suburban perform. Um, but again, back to the biennial, uh, you know, that wasn't that wasn't my interest. Uh, I something when you were the question about institutions um, before. I'm very pragmatic about institutions um, or, or or frames of support and an institution like the Whitney. I'm not particularly uh, want to use this as a, a point of institutional critique, kind of take it down. I think there's other, at this point in time, in 2013-14, given the Whitney Bayette, the, 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 given the nature of the exhibition, given the building, this uh, you know, New York institution, um, you know, all those things came into consideration in terms of how, who, and, and why. And, and by the end of October, you'll all know who will be. Just very quickly, and then I think we can open the discussion for a few questions. But getting, is how, how does that? Is there a strategy behind your choosing an artist, or do you really, again, like does that come naturally? Or do you think sometimes, okay, I have now like four established artists. I worked with four established. I should really work with someone kind of not so well known. I think differently about it. I think of. Um, what seems interesting for me and a lot of times in a kind of larger context for a bigger discourse in the art world. And often working with somebody who's well known gives me agency to work with somebody who's not so well known. Um, and you know, for me, thinking of the world as either, thinking of the art world as either a field or, I should just say the world, as a field or as multiple hierarchies rather than the hierarchy that we normally apply to it always feels more interesting and engaging and often you put elements together that wouldn't normally find their way onto the same wall or in the same situation and they function incredibly well together and so I, uh, I can't say that it was that it's all by design um, but a big part of it is looking for something that doesn't have a prescription to it I just want to just add one more thing. It's, it's a, a very good good question because I think in the art world we don't understand that there's not only you know history behind these decisions that that through you know years, 15 years of disturbing, being middle age, like we kind of acquire and conceive things, artists conceive things, and make these kind of decisions based on that. The art world always wants to think that it's you know responding to the last two months, the last year, what happened since the last biennial. And I think it's just really good to know that you know, there's these, we see the long form of all of this and respond to that long form. And most importantly, trust it, right? Um, and act on, on, on our understanding of that. Um, you know, sometimes to great success, sometimes to, you know, misunderstanding. But um, 
uh, I think it's the trust in, in what we're doing that uh, is, is convincing and authentic in that process. Great that. So I think there's maybe time for two questions or so. So we're, we're really at the end of the, the talk, more or less. But if, you, if, if there's someone with a question, please um, feel free to. Because I really want to open it up just for a little while. No more questions. <laughs> Can't be impossible. No, I, I have a question. Please, I, yes. I'm curious <coughs> to get back to this. The, the, the conversation that's kind of started and touched on it. I do think that you both are formed out of a kind of dialogue that was here, maybe, in the 80s and 90s. I mean, we talk loosely about the Pixar's generation, but I think there are certain faculty members, certain characters in the community, um, maybe that were influential for both of you, maybe not. But um, I, I'm, I'm, I am interested in the kind of consciousness, or even a class consciousness that was in the art world that, was, that maybe set a kind of die in Chicago, and I'm curious about hearing your takes on it. I mean, certainly, you both are still involved in a conversation about painting, um, whether you're romantic about it or not. Um, at the same time, you're kind of critical in undermining it as a, the support that it sort of presents. So I'm, I'm curious how you got there, you know, and you're both here. Um, I don't know if you can... I'll be kind of short and punctual in terms of how we think about it. Um, you know, there's certainly, outside of where one is, I mean, I was raised in the Midwest, so I have this kind of sensibility that, you know, it's silly to fight that, I take it on fully. Um, but, you know, in terms of it being schooled, right, I was in school in the 80s, mostly in 20th century studies at the time, um, and dealing with the kind of criticality. But then in practice, you know, really looking at something like Randolph Street. Like Randolph Street was the form, right, and the artists that uh, uh, would, were being featured there reflected not so much a Midwestern or Chicago sensibility, but, 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 but kind of, yes, uh, you know, what was going on in you know, New York and how it kind of started to kind of shape, a conceptual shaping here in Chicago. Um, it, had, it has nothing to do with the images, obviously. Right. And I, I think that's the case with Galen, even though we've worked with images in a recent MCA against that, if anything. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I went to Northwestern to work with Ed Paschke. I mean, that, that that was what one would do, right? If one was sticking to the Midwest, one would embrace that, and, you know, it was immediate, like, nope, that was it. But Randolph, when I think Randolph Street, and I'm no expert on it, I mean, I think about performance. Mm -hmm. I think about a lot of kind of installations that had civic or social or kind of cultural impact, especially local. I mean, that's, yeah. well, that's what I yeah. think about when I think about Randolph Street. That's not images. No, 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 absolutely not. It's conceptual based. Conceptual based. And, and my husband Brad was at uh, University of Illinois at the time I was at Northwestern, which was a very different program than it is now. But, you know, Gene Dunning, Gersh Perlman were his teachers. You know, we were looking to, you know, this generation of artists um, in Chicago at, at the time. Great. People don't often talk about that. Gene no, Dunning, Gersh Perlman. No, well, no. Uh, but it's, it's, it's very foundational to the the city, the art of how we think about it. Right. Uh, there's amnesia here. I, I, I can't understand it, but this, this place, I mean, we have so many, and we have an influx of so many young artists that come to our schools, and I, I just, they don't carry, yeah. You don't look at me. You don't, you don't, you don't have a take on that? Well, it's such a broad question. I'm not sure what, what you're asking. Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm really, I guess, asking about if you think there was a foundational kind of structure that helped you make the choices that you made. I guess when you're saying you worked with early conceptual artists in New York, that's like who Robert Barry? Robert Barry, um, So maybe your, your, your die was cast before you got here. Well, I never felt limited to Chicago. I always thought I was part of a larger discourse. And I'd like to say one of the things that, in thinking about it, that is underplayed is how important the original Art Chicago was. That um, we all kind of, it was the beginning of really the international art world. Um, and almost immediately when I began showing, I began showing extensively in Europe. 
Um, and partly a lot of Europeans were coming here, a lot of us were going to Europe. There was an exchange that instead of thinking that we were talking to each other, I was talking to Stephen Prina in Los Angeles and I was over to and Vienna and Adrian Chies in Nice and no one thought anything about it. Although, you know, it was kind of like, it was a revelation when fax machines came in. But you think I'm kidding, we, we used to have to mail things. Um, so the idea that, you know, the phone would ring at two o'clock and there'd be a fax was a big deal. It's kind of collapsed. And now people don't think anything about that. The expectation for a young artist is that they belong, they're a citizen of the world, they're an artist of the world rather than an artist in Chicago. Um, and I actually believe that. I think that Chicago suits me well as an artist, that I'm able to be connected and also not feel the kind of <coughs> heat of the market or those kind of restrictions, which I think I'm like incredibly susceptible to. And it allows me to kind of make something that I find more interesting. Um, but it's not specific. I think it happened globally. It happened in Frankfurt. You know, Europe is different because it didn't have a center, it had many centers. We tend to have a center. And so the idea that now it's become more decentralized. It kind of, kind of fits my idea, or maybe it helped form my idea of either a field or multiple hierarchies. Um, but it's just, are we done? Can we, can we ask Rato probably whether you fit into Cleveland? Again, please. Do you fit into Cleveland? Oh, yes. Yeah. I really think, and this is maybe, I think it's true what Galen says. I think it's, for me as a curator, I think I wouldn't, I would say it's only, a chance and an opportunity to kind of act from outside of the center at this moment in time, where with everything at hand that I have. I just think it slows me down when I want it to, and still I have like everything at hand to kind of reach out to everybody whenever I want. I kind of understand that this has a lot to do with things that we maybe don't even think about in the first moment, like technological and things like that kind of stuff. Really. It really meant something different to be in a place outside of the center 20 years ago than it would have been so. Um, so I have, we have to finish here. I want to thank all of you very much, though. It was a pleasure. And I want to, again, um, mention your exhibition that is coming up. And um, said in November 2nd? November 1st. So, November 1st, and see you all in Cleveland. And then see you all in at the Whitney Biennial next year, too. So, thank you very much.